From the Lower Colorado River Authority, this is Wavelength. The creation of this new river authority will help electrify rural Texas. And so today, we gather here to dedicate this mighty structure for Canada. This has been a great organization for 70 years. It's going to be a great organization for a long time to come. Hi everyone, welcome to the April 2005 edition of Wavelength. Well, it was one of the most dramatic moments in the history of Tom Miller Dam. It became lead story on local and national TV news programs, front page news and papers across the country. And without the quick response and teamwork of several LCR employees, this story may have had a very different outcome. Dirk Hoekstra and Monica Barnes lifted their anchor from the waters of Lake Austin Monday evening and immediately began drifting toward this open floodgate at Miller Dam. When the boat engine failed to start, the couple knew they were in trouble. This is my spot. This is my spot to fish. I love this spot. Everett Piper was fishing just above the dam when he heard a cry for help coming from the lake. And I was talking to my uh, younger brother on the phone at the time. So I told my brother, I said, let me call you back. And that's when I called 911. LCRA security officer William Dildeen had just started his shift at 7 p.m. when he got a page. At that time, I began to run to the dam, notifying our dispatch while I was on the way. When I arrived on scene, I saw the female subject still in the boat, and the boat was halfway submerged. Hoxtra had been knocked out of the boat and was pulled through the open floodgate, down a 60-foot wall of tumbling water. Meanwhile, Barnes clung to the now trapped boat. LCRA crews at the Hydro Operations Control Center spotted the boat on camera monitors and called the dam. We were able to see a Austin APD rescue boat uh, out in front of the floodgate, so we moved the camera over to the number one floodgate, and there was a boat wedged in it with a lady in it that was in a bad situation. Our adrenaline was a-flowing. We, we were scared for her, and we, we were wondering why the boat was even stuck the way it was. Somebody was definitely watching out for them because that gate was open seven and a half foot. That boat should have went right on through, but it hung up there, and that lady was sitting there, and that boat was real stable at the time we saw her on the camera. Keith Hamilton and Dan Pyle rushed to the top of Miller Dam with rope in hand, where they were joined by Officer Dildeen and Everett Piper, the fisherman. He said, let's lo lower it down one of the bystanders, let's lower the rope. And I said, no, we're going to have to have a slip knot where she can get the slip knot around her waist, you know, stick her arms through it, put it around her waist and tighten it up and then hold on to the rope. Were you afraid that she couldn't hold on to the rope if you just put it down there oh, without yeah. a loop? I said, that ain't going to work. And I said, we're going to have to have a slip knot around her waist or, you know, she's in shock. When we looked down, her eyes were in desperation, and the boat was starting to go jerk like, like it was going to go at any time. Well, I was just hoping she would get the rope around her, because at first she was just holding on to it, and we kept yelling at her, get it around your body and pull it up tight and hold it, and we're not going to let you go. Even if the boat goes, you're fine. At that time, we hoisted the female subject up. Park police came in with the boat, grabbed the female subject, we let go of the rope, they backed out of there, out of the current, and was able to get out of harm's way. Meanwhile, Dirk Hoxter had walked up out of the river a quarter mile downstream, banged up, but okay. Operators later opened the gate to allow the boat to slide through. You had the training, and that's great, but you implemented it. You had presence of mind enough to keep your cool and remember what you were trained to do. And that's hard to do when you're under pressure like that. So for you all to do what you did last night, um, I'm real proud of you. I thank you for what you did. And in my book, till the day I die, you will be my LCRA hero. So I, I appreciate it. You did good. In March, the Elsery Board of Directors met with the San Antonio Water System Board to discuss the status of the Elsery Saws Water Project. 
The project is designed to help satisfy the long-term water needs in both the Lower Colorado River Basin and the San Antonio area while protecting the environment. Plans call for building off-channel reservoirs to hold the water and a pipeline system to deliver the raw water to San Antonio. There's a seven-year study period and in 2010, uh, San Antonio and LCRA will make a decision whether or not the project will go forward if we address all the concerns with the environment, uh, their water availability, and those sort of things. And then there's a 10-year period to where um, we will um, design and construct the facilities um, before getting the water to San Antonio and having the water available in our lower basin. One of the major studies currently underway will create a model of the river at various flow rates. This information will help LCRA determine how diverting water during high flow periods will affect Matagorda Bay and downstream users. Parsons, an engineering firm hired by LCRA, is conducting the study by tracking red dye which is placed in the river at five mile intervals. The fluorometer actually measures the concentration of the dye and then it sends a, the information to the laptop here every three seconds. And then the GPS here is taking our location down to a sub-meter. And it sends a location every 10 seconds. Then the pathometer over here sends the depths about every second. And then way in the back is the water quality meter, and it's reading the water quality uh, dissolved oxygen and, uh, conductivity, temperature, and pH every 30 seconds and sending it to the laptop also. They will take 10 to 12,000 data readings over this five-mile stretch of river. These crews will come back out to the river in about two months and take the same readings when the water is flowing at a much lower level. Texas leads the nation in flood-related deaths. In 2004, 15 people died in Texas floodwaters. 13 of those deaths were vehicle related. The National Weather Service declared March 21st through 25th Flood Safety Awareness Week. They have also launched a national campaign designed to raise awareness about low water crossings. The campaign's called Turn Around, Don't Drown. CRA has joined forces with the Weather Service to help spread the word by placing TAD bumper stickers on all LCRA vehicles. And we've also distributed uh, thousands of these to our communities throughout the basin and they're committed to putting them on city and county vehicles and even more importantly on school buses. So hopefully within the next few months we're going to see, we've distributed almost 10,000 of these things now, so hopefully you're going to see 10,000 what I call rolling billboards going up and down this base and carrying this message. Sedbick says many counties and communities have done a good job of marking dangerous crossings with signs, flood gauges, barriers, and even drop arms. But many times drivers still don't stop. Unfortunately, we can document a number of cases where drivers have gone around barricades and even stop their vehicles and move the barricade out of the way and then drive into that low water crossing and unfortunately many of them die. Bastrop High School senior Brandon Rogers is doing his part to help educate and protect the public from deadly floodwaters. For his Eagle Scout community project, Brandon made these turn around, don't drown barriers and presented them to county commissioners with special dedications to those who have lost their lives in floodwaters. Six will be actually road barriers. Two will be used for educational purposes in Texas. Um, uh, I made dedication signs on two of these uh, about the memory of the people who lo lose their lives every year in floodwaters. To see a young person stepping forward to take his role in society to prevent such accidents as those, I'm very, very proud of you. Thank you. LCRA is also taking this message into area schools to help educate young drivers and their parents. 
The next time you come up to a low water crossing like this, remember our message, turn around, don't drown. It just may save your life. Welcome to the Smithville Rail Car Facility. Bet you didn't expect to see me here. Today, we're going to take you on a tour to show you what we do here. It all starts here in the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. LCRA coal cars make the 1,600-mile trip from Wyoming to the Fayette Power Project in LaGrange, loaded with western coal, which will fuel the three generating units here at FPP. Each of these cars holds over 100 tons of coal. The trains are made up of 135 cars and are about a mile long. LCRA owns 1,500 rail cars, and each one travels about 150,000 miles a year. You can imagine with this kind of wear and tear, these cars require a lot of maintenance. But each car that we work on, we actually keep a computer database on. And each thing that we do to the cars has a four-digit job code. And by inserting that into the uh, computer system, we're able to keep a detailed maintenance history on each and every car. And not only does it tell what the maintenance was done, there's some coding in the, the program that allows us to tell why we did the maintenance. The 19 employees here at Smithville not only service about eight coal cars a day, they also do special steel fabrication work for projects all across the company. Everything from these massive floodgates built for Starkey Dam to this ornamental fencing for the Riverside Conference Center in Bastrop. One of my most memorable, I guess, was putting up the suspension bridge at Max Starkey Dam. I mean, that's, that was, nobody here had ever done anything like that, so that was a, that was a learning experience in itself. We're diverse in, in a lot of different skills, and our guys are willing to work and travel to work if they need to, help out on outages, uh, work overtime whenever it's required, and I think teamwork plays a big part in the whole scope of things. Today, Bob has been given the challenging job of teaching me how to weld. It was at Leadership LCRA graduation that General Manager Joel Beal challenged me to visit Smithville and learn a new skill. Tighten it up a little bit. After being outfitted with all my PPEs, that's personal protective equipment, we went to work. Don't touch it. Okay. I'm sorry, this thing is still on fire. <laughs> Yeah, try and put that wire right, right, right there. You want it right dead in the middle of where those two pieces join. That's perfect. Let's see how you... I think, I think we're going to have her, have her turning pro here pretty sharp. <laughs> I believe so. My final test turned out to be my graduation certificate and personal souvenir of this great adventure. Uh, Jill, just tell Joe Beal that you can come down here well with me anytime. All right, yeah, <laughs> all right. So the next time you flip on the light switch, think about our employees here at the Smithville Rail Car Facility and how they help keep electricity flowing. This month on Board Profile, meet Ida Carter from Marble Falls. Ida Carter was appointed to the LCRA board by Governor Rick Perry in 2004 to serve out the term of Dave Kithill after he was elected county judge in Burnett County. Ida now has been appointed by the governor and approved by the Senate to serve a new six-year term on the board. Ida and husband Jim moved to Marble Falls in 1995 after retiring from their family business, Jim Carter and Associates Architects in Houston. Jim designed their beautiful home here on the shores of Lake Marble Falls. They were going to fish, read, play golf, and relax, but as Ida says, they both flunked retirement. Ida loves to read and is a member of the Horseshoe Bay Book Club, 
She's also a member of the Highland Lake Service League, which raises funds for local nonprofit organizations. And she volunteers here at the Marble Falls Chamber of Commerce Information Center. But Ida says her main focus this past year has been the LCRA board, something she has found very rewarding. I didn't seek this out. You know, I hadn't uh, sent in an application or hadn't given any thought to going on the LCRA board, but I did get the call from the governor's office asking if I would come in and have an interview. And I thought, well, this might be interesting. You know, it is, a, a LCRA is a really important part of this community. And I thought well, this could be helpful to the community and I might could make a contribution to LCRA. Ida says her first year on the board has not been without controversy. There were tough decisions to be made, but I felt like that uh, they were given a lot of consideration and that the board ended up making the right decision on those issues that were controversial. I, and I think that will be proven out in the long run, that those decisions needed to be made and that LCRA was the right uh, entity to handle uh, the Hamilton Pool Road issues, the Sweetwater Ranch issues. Jim Carter says he flunked retirement when he started this housing development called Four Oaks about a year ago. He says he's worked closely with LCRA to control stormwater runoff on this project. Jim says his wife is very dedicated to her new duties with LCRA. She's enjoyed the work and she's enjoyed the board. She brags about the board constantly. Uh, and uh, she's, of course she's in love with all the LCRA personnel. It, it's just amazing. Um, yeah, it's, she it's thinks it's one of the finest organizations in the country. Ida Carter's term on the LCRA board ends in 2011. Well, that's it for this edition of Wavelength. We'll look forward to seeing you again next time.